Alright, thank you guys. So now we got, uh, well we have a tradition here in GNA and we all know that, right? Ben Shao, you can have to uh, go all the way to the back. Okay, um, we're going to have the red carpet lined out here. No red carpet today. Okay. <laughs> so then yeah, we're going to go into this. Uh, Mr. Ben Shao, at this uh, week's meeting, Ben Shao's topic will be identifying vision problems and using vision therapy to correct them. Okay? And uh, Ben Shao is a developmental optomet op optometrist and has been practicing for 11 years. Um, that's when I was 16. As a developmental optometrist, he served his patient by identifying deficits in how their eyes work with which may contribute to worsening prescriptions. Poor depth, perception, double vision, visual fatigue, inability to properly track print while reading, I need that, uh, poor reading, comprehension, and much more. These are which cannot be fixed with glasses alone. Furthermore, while most optometrists gives, just gives patients stronger prescription when their patient's eyes get worse, Benny is trying to find out what is about the way their eyes work that is causing them to worsen. If he can identify the problem, then using vision therapy, he can actually treat the problems and get their eyes working better. So without further ado, let's have Mr. Benny Shaw in front. Benny! Yourself. I'm going to pass something around to you guys. Uh, give me one I'm going to pass out a very high tech uh, visual feedback device. It's a string with some beads on it. Dr. Charles Brock is a he's an ophthalmologist, and uh, it's not very high tech. It's just a stream of some beads. I, those are handmade. I got the materials at Michaels. Uh, I did it myself. No, I could have bought them. I could have bought them, but I didn't have it myself. So it's very simple. Um, but yeah. So how many of you guys have actually heard of something called vision therapy before? Have any of you guys actually heard of this? But who hasn't? So, vision therapy, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, we've got a few hundred optometrists in the Bay Area and there's only, there's less than 10 of us who are actually doing, 10, who are actually doing vision therapy in our offices. And part of the reason why is because it's actually pretty tough to understand. It's actually really tough to understand because um, what, they, what most optometrists fail to understand is that just because you have a vision problem doesn't mean that you're having problems functionally. So, um, I'll give you a quick, quick uh, back when I was in school, it's just the whole reason why I got into it. Back when I was in school, it's my third year in optometry school. And I had a kid who was a, he was 11 years old, he was a sixth grade kid. Um, he, his main complaint was that he was doing poorly in school. He could not read for more than 20 something minutes at a time, after which he just kind of get a headache, couldn't concentrate and so forth. Um, and he wasn't keeping up in class. And uh, we did a test called the Dyslexia Determination Test on him. And basically what it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a visual encoding and decoding test to see, you know, when you look at a word, do you recognize that word right away? Or, or do you have to kind of figure out, really, if you get a wrong word, that word says, enamored. Oh, enamored. You know, do you see, do you do that? You have to, do you see the word and automatically recognize it, or do you have to kind of break it down, or do you even know how to break it down? 
Okay, sometimes they, they look at it and they don't really know how to break it down. So, we did a dyslexia determination test and we found out that this kid, he's in sixth grade, he has the vocabulary level of a high schooler. And yet, if you give him a paragraph or a short story to read, his comprehension level drops to that of a fourth grader. So, obviously he's got a problem here because uh, he's not keeping up in school and his comprehension level isn't where it's supposed to be. He's got the vocabulary, but he doesn't have the comprehen comprehension scale. Yes? How would this kid come to you? Um, he was referred to us, I don't, actually I don't recall exactly how. I don't remember exactly how he ended up in, in our office. This was at our school clinic. Uh, I think it might have been from one of the teachers recommending that you know come to our school just to see just, just to see if, if there's anything going on. So this poor kid, he had a problem called convergence insufficiency. Basically, it's when he's looking at something up close, his eyes don't pull together accurately. So you know, when you're reading, your right eye and your left eye should actually be pointing at the same point in space, and it should be pretty much automatic. So just boom, you're looking right there. If I'm looking at a target ten, ten inches away, my eyes are just boom, they're they're there. And it should be able to track accurately from one from one word to the next word to the next word to the next word. So this kid, in his case, if he's looking, if his mind is, is on something ten inches away, his eyes go to someplace around sixteen inches away. He's not going right there. It's not it's not aiming right at the right target, you no, know, at the right distance. So target's here, his eyes go here. So what I want you to do with, with that little stream right now is um, actually you may want to get somebody else to help you. So uh, you hold one end of the screen, you put your finger through one end of the screen, okay, and hold it up to your nose like this. And then, and then uh, you want to spread out the beads. Actually, let me, get, let me get one of the beads. Hold on. So what I want you to do is this. So you just take a string like this, and you take the beads and spread them out. Now just spread it out like this. And it actually probably helpful to uh, have somebody else on the other end because it doesn't go off. But uh, so what you do, you hold, you hold the screen like this. So what I want you to do, there's three beads on there, right? I want you to look at the middle bead. When you look at the middle bead, when you're looking at the middle bead, the other two beads are the double. First of all, are the double. Does anybody not see that? If you're looking at the little B, the other two Bs should be doubles. Right? So if I'm looking at the if I'm looking at the silver B right now, I should see two of the purple ones behind it and two of the green ones in front of it. Do you see that? So when you're looking at the middle B, when you're looking at the middle B, the one that you're looking at should be single. The other two Bs should be double. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Now the other thing is this. If the other two beads are double, you are actually seeing two strings. Yeah. And when you look at the, so when you're looking at that middle bead, the two strings are the two strings crossing and meeting right at the middle bead that you're looking at. Yeah. They are? Is there anybody where it's not meeting right where that bead is? So I can't right now. If you look at the gold bead right now, you see two red beads behind it and two green beads in front. Yeah. I only see one green and two reds. You see one green and two reds. So when you look at, oh, you know what? Bring that gold one forward more towards you. Have it more center. Okay, there. You try to get it again. Okay, so look at the gold one. Do you see two green behind it? Okay. So when you look at the gold one, do you see the two strings crossing right at the middle beam? Yeah. You do. Okay, great. Okay. So that's normal. So the, the problem, if, if you're looking at a particular bead, but the two strings are crossing somewhere behind it, then you have the same problem as that kid I'm talking about. If you're looking at the big little B, but you see the two strings crossing in front of it, that means that while you're paying attention to here, your eyes are actually crossing and meeting up someplace in front of it. So there's a misalignment. There's a slight misalignment. Okay. Right. So this is your this is my little high-tech visual feedback device. Doesn't require anything, you know, terrible high tech. No, I got less for less than ten dollars. Yeah. Sorry, no. <laughs> I, I gotta do this back up to the patients. So, anyways, uh, the other exercise, this is a little testing device. Well, it's actually it's really more of a training device. I mean, I don't use that for testing. Uh, the broad stream, basically, all it's designed to do is just give you feedback on what your eyes are actually doing. And most people, they're not aware that they're doing this. They're really not aware at all. So, what I want to talk about is this. So, um, you know, most of us. 
you know, you know how like some people they're more focused on big picture and other people are focused on little detail? You know, when you look at a forest, you see the forest, or you see the trees, or you see the leaves, or you see the bugs. And can you make the connections between everything? And when you look at something, what do you what do you pay attention to? And what we're finding is that if you if your personality type is such that you tend to like heavy on the details, that you do certain things visually, that if you're big on the big picture, or big on the connections, then you do other things. And if you have a vision problem, so at least with, as far as vision is concerned, when you see something, you know, ideally you want to see a little bit of a little bit of You want to kind of get a big picture. You want to be able to understand the little details. You want to understand how things relate to each other as well. That's how you get full comprehension of your world, of whatever, you know, whether it's a situation or a book or what have you. So if you have a vision problem, then because your eyes aren't functioning the way they're supposed to, um, you're going to have difficulty taking in all the information that you ought to be getting. So for myself, um, for myself, I'm, I'm a very big detail-oriented person. Uh, as a kid, when I draw, I used to like drawing airplanes. And when I drew airplanes, I would draw the rivets on the airplane. And I was like, but that's, that's what I was like. I was really, really detail oriented. And when, and, and, and because I'm so darn detail oriented, the fact that I have a vision problem means that you know, if I have a vision problem and I can't take in all the information I want, I'm gonna have to make some sacrifices. Because I can't take in everything. I can't get a big picture, so I'll pick what I pick and choose what I decided what, what I really like. So if I can't get the big picture, well, if I don't pay attention to the big picture, then I'm gonna really try and focus on all the little details. And for me, if I want to kind of understand everything that's going on, then what I have to do is I have to take in all of the details before I can kind of link everything together, make the connections, and understand what it is I'm looking at. Okay, so. Is there any questions on that so far? I mean, this is a very, very, very big abstract concept. I want you to think about your eyes like a um, like a modem or, or, or like a T1 cable or whatever. Okay, you got you, you can only get so much in at once. Okay, and if you have a vision problem, then the amount of information the, the, the amount of information that you can take in through your eyes per unit of time is reduced. And if it's reduced, then you have to be able to function to do things on a daily basis, then your person, depending on your personality type, whatever it is you choose to focus on, you're going to focus on those little details, whether it's the details or the big connections or, or what have you, depending on your personality type. So for me, yes sir. Oh, so for people that ha that can speed read really, really fast and yes. comprehend, they must have almost perfect vision pretty much. Well, uh, there are tricks to that. So one of the things, I'll get, I'll get into this in a little bit. So if you have a problem with with your ability to you know, keep your eyes working together, so if you end up being a really good speed reader, then you might be able to make the connections and you have a really good grasp of the general idea. But what, what you might be deficient in is your ability to remember fine details. Okay, so I, I've seen patients where their eyes, I had one patient, this, this is a while back, this, this one patient that actually worked at Apple. Uh, he was the kind of person where if he's looking at something here, his eyes light up here. They, they, they cross them closer than where they're supposed to be. And so what happened is, in order for him to avoid double vision, he would actually have to under focus his eyes a little bit so that his eyes are actually not in good focus. So basically he allows it to be a little bit blurry all the time in order for it not to be double. Okay. But by doing so, so basically his his uh, emphasis was on keeping the signal so that he could get the general idea. So he had no problem with comprehension. But, he, but guess what? He sees blurry all the time. He's actually a little bit blurry all the time but he ignores the blur. And because of this he's actually a very bad speller. Because okay. he, 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 can't, he can't take in all that information all at once. He can't remember exactly how the word is spelled without sacrificing some degree of comprehension. Yes? Can these vision problems be discovered in a routine vision exam? Um, I'll discover it in my routine vision exam. Unfortunately, most optometrists don't do that. So, what I'm talking about has less to do with whether or not you can see clearly. What I'm talking about has more to do with how your eyes function. Are they lining up in the right place? Are, they, are, they, uh, are your eye muscles able to coordinate back and forth? Because if there's a deficit in that, then that's going to affect you in some area of your life. Now, as an adult, 
if you're a poor leader and you're garbage man, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know? So you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, at a certain point earlier in your life, because of whatever problem you had, you made decisions that made full use, that made better use of what your strengths were, right? Now, if you're a poor leader, then you're, you're not, you're, you know, you end up being a garbage man and you're making a decent living, then okay, fine, you know, c continue on, you know, be on your merry way. Um, and in my case, you know, the fact that I was, I, I had my own vision problems, I mean, I'm extremely nearsighted. I had LASIK a few years back, my glasses are really thick, until when I went up with LASIK. Um, and what happened for me was, because my eyes didn't work together normally, I'm one of those people where if I'm looking here, my eyes tend to focus a little bit closer than where they should be. And for me, my way of getting, so for me, it didn't affect my reading, but what, what it did happen, what did happen is that when I'm looking, if the grid starts to kind of jump a little bit, it, it, it just get closer and closer and closer. And that caused my eyesight to get worse. So I'm extremely, extremely nearsighted. And then when it comes to throwing a basketball, I'm all over the place. My mother plays better than me. Well, she actually, she actually she played in the high school team, so she's actually pretty good. But in any case, you know, I'm a decent sized guy for an Asian guy, you know. I'm not super tall, but I'm, not, I'm okay. But you know, I can't shoot a, I can't shoot a layup, I can't dribble, I can't catch. I can't do any of that. I'm not very good at that at all. Um, you know, I'm not the kind of person where I'm a very, very good serial processor. I'm a very poor parallel processor. You guys understand the difference? So serial, serial, serial processing, you know, I can take one little bit, I can, I can take really complex information, I can comprehend it, and I can, you know, analyze all the detail like crazy, like an engineer. But you talk about parallel processing, okay, and you know, running multiple things at once, I fall apart really easily. Okay, because all along, because of my vision problem, I decided to sacrifice big picture for, for little detail. Yes, sir. I have a question based off of that. So that, does that affect you from multitasking effectively in today's world? We're all about multitasking. It can. Yes, yeah. it can. It can. So, so you got to think about it. So you, are you a good are you a good serial processor or are you a good parallel processor? Which one are you? So uh, something I want to quickly talk about your your brain and your eyes. Okay, I want you to think about vision as a computer. So it is a computer which generates an understanding of your world. So you know how they talk about. There's that, there's that one verse in the Bible uh, where, where there is no vision, the, the people perish. So I ask you guys something. Do blind people have vision? Yes. Vision. As we understand vision. Vision being understanding your external surroundings and being able to interact with it in terms of depth, in terms of space. You can, right? I mean, you can formulate a mental picture of what the world is around you based on your feel, based on your hearing, etc. You can formulate it, right? So, in terms of vision, black and white vision, they don't have any eyesight. Vision and eyesight are two different things. Okay, eyesight is, is a potential component of vision, but it's not exclusive. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. So when I, talk, when I talk about vision, I'm talking about how do you interact with your environment through your eyes. In more, in, in, and not just your eyes, but your, your sense of space, your sense of depth, etc. Uh, all of that is coming through your eyes. And if, you, if there's something wrong with how your eyes work, then that's going to interfere with how you perceive your world. So, if you think about your eyes, if you think about vision as a computer, you know, a computer's got hardware and it's got software. So your hardware, is, we're talking about your eyeballs. You know, your eyeballs, the eye muscle, the nerves, etc. These are the hardware. Your software is all the nerves that feed back towards your eyes, telling you how your brain controls where your eyes go. So if I'm looking at something 10 inches away, do my eyes automatically go and line up right there? If I'm looking at something far away, do they line up right there? And if I'm looking at something, if I'm trying to catch a ball flying you know, 70 miles an hour, can I accurately follow that? Okay, so that's where the, the software output is concerned. So there's output as well as input. There's, it goes in both directions. How well you hear has nothing to do with how well you live your ears. But how well you see, how well you're able to comprehend what you're seeing, has everything to do with how your eyes are able to interact with the environment. Okay, so if you think about vision as a computer, you got hardware, you got software. So basically, what I specialize is in the software. And the typical optometrist exam is really just interested in are you seeing clearly, and is your hardware in working order. Uh, the thing is, though, the thing that they don't take into consideration is that if you've got a software problem, that the software problem can actually affect how well the hardware works. Okay, 
because, like I was saying, my eyes, when I'm looking at something close, I aim too close. Therefore, I'm going to compensate by bringing the print closer. But when I bring it closer and closer, it puts more stress on my eyes. When it puts more stress on my eyes, the stress causes my eyes to stretch and grow longer so that I become more and more nearsighted. So, what are some of the ways that this stress create problems on your vision? So, you know, as, as far as stress is concerned, you know, stress can have different e effects on different people. You know, generally speaking, if you put stress on somebody, and we're now talking about how your autonomic nervous system responds. And when we talk about autonomic nervous system, I'm talking about the aspect of your nervous system that is that is not under conscious control. I mean, you can, can kind of train it to a degree. But we're talking about the aspect of your nervous system that is not con under conscious control. I'm talking about things like, let's say, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your heart rate, etc. You know, that's not under conscious control, right? Okay, so in the same way, how your eyes work is not really under conscious control. Okay, and if it's not under conscious control, then, you know, how do you affect it? So, if you put a lot of stress on your eyes, and the software isn't very properly developed, then that stress is going to lead to one of three outcomes. Okay, so let's say when you have, when you have stress on them, so let's say, let's say you're walking in a forest and you've got a, suddenly you've got a pack of dogs, a pack of wolves chasing after you. What are the three possible things that you do? Run like run. hell? Turn to run. Okay, that's, that's one way. What's the second one? Fight. Fight. You what? Fight. You fight. Right. You try to run away or you try to fight them. Or the third way is? Fight. fight. What? Fight. Fight. Hide. Hide. Oh, hide. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't thinking of hide. I mean, hide is really just another aspect of, 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 of running. Right. You just one aspect of running. Run and hide. Was, was, what I had in mind was freezing. You're so scared that you can't. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Shout. you play. Shout. Shout. You faint. You play possum. Yeah. Okay. You just faint. Okay. You just. You just. You, you, you freeze. You're so scared. Uh, I can't move. Okay. So when I'm measuring how the eyes are working, what I'm trying to measure is: Are your eyes running away? Are your eyes fighting? Or are they freezing? And depending on the response, it can have different outcomes. So if you're trying to run away, so for example, if I have a patient where I'm doing a, a, a what we call a pencil push-up test. So I just have, I take, take a pencil and I have them look at the pencil and bring it really close to them. And I look to see whether or not their eyes pull in. So if I have a person where where they do this, I see one, I see one, oh gee, oh my gosh, oh I see double now. Ah, I feel uncomfortable, I feel uncomfortable. That's somebody who hasn't figured out a way to get around the problem yet. The problem's there, it's still causing discomfort. Another possibility. I see one, I see one, I see one. And then, what happens is one eye flips out, the other one's still looking at it. Okay? So I see one, I see one, I see one. Every time, it's always the left eye going out, the right eye continues looking at it. Okay? So if you have somebody like that, I see one, I see one, I see one. I see one, but actually their eyes are not looking. Their eyes are not, their eyes aren't doing this. They're going ee, and then one eye drifts out, and then one eye keeps looking at it, and they think they still see one. But they actually see double, but one of the eyes, they just kind of ignore it. Okay, that was a kind of running, that's kind of a running away type of uh, response. And with those kind of people, what I typically find, the eye that keeps looking is very nearsighted. The eye that goes out is not nearsighted, or much less. So if you see somebody with a really, really thick prescription on one side, really thin on the other, try that. Be like, yeah, I see one, I see one, and you know, one eye goes out, the other one keeps looking. I'd say probably 80% of the time that, that'll happen. Most of the time that's what happens. Okay, so that's one way. Um, another way is if you put the, the, the try to keep both eyes on it, they keep both eyes on the target, and what happens is the stress just causes both eyes to get worse. They're good at it. Okay. So this is a few different ways to potentially deal with the problem. So um, now as far as how this affects kids. Well, personally, I mean, I would prefer to see kids because here, here's the thing. If you have an adult who's had this problem for a long time, they typically have figured out ways of getting around the problem. They have strategies. I like to look at it this way. So let's say you've got a pain in your wrist. And because of this pain in your wrist, you have trouble, you have trouble writing accurately. And your words look really sloppy. If I fix that pain right when it starts, then you're going to be able to hold your pencil normally and your, your print's going to look normal. And your, your writing speed's going to be normal. But if I allow the paint to be there for 30 years and now you've got this weird messed up pencil grip, okay, and your writing
body normally like that, then even if I even if I take the pain away, even if I treat the pain, you're still going to be comfortable writing this way. It's not going to change. Okay, I have to not only fix the problem, I have to readjust how, I have to take away all this adaptation. And that's actually much tougher to do. So, with kids, if they haven't had that much time to deal with it, haven't figured out ways to get around the problem, it's actually, the, the, the benefits are much more apparent. On the other hand, you have an adult who all their life has been a poor reader, and now because they've been a poor reader, so therefore they're, they're, let's say, some kind of art. They're an artist of some kind, they're a designer. But they would like to be able to do more reading, or, or to, to get into something that they weren't able to do before, then hey, then maybe I can help them. Because, but, yeah, because you have a specific problem, or you have a specific goal in mind that you want to be able to accomplish. Uh, but if it's, but if not, you know, if, if, if that's not the case, then, you know, fine, you know, go on. <laughs> it's perfectly okay. You know, just like I was saying, if you have somebody who's a poor reader and they're they're a garbage man, and they don't have to do any reading, then they run, no problem. Uh, so I find, personally, I find it's much more helpful to address the problem when they're younger. So, you know, and then, you know, another possibility is like for sports. And for myself, um, for myself, I've never been really good at sports. On the other hand, I'm one of the people where I'm so far along, messed up, that it's actually very, very difficult to, to bring back to normal. Uh, hey, you're honest. I, I'm perfectly really honest. And you know, you know what's really, really interesting is that the whole stereotype of, of nearsighted people being bad at sports is very true to a degree. To a degree, it's actually very, very true. Because when you're really nearsighted, you got nearsighted because you got some binocular vision problems. Okay? Otherwise, you wouldn't be so nearsighted. And if you have those problems, it's probably going to affect you in your hand coordination because you're not going to be able to track distance targets. And so basically, people who are nearsighted, basically what they've done is they figured out, they figured out that you know, if I want to, I've got a vision problem, and I decided, I made a decision, a subconscious decision, that I'm going to focus on little details up close instead of things far away. And the jocks who are good at sports that hate reading, they, they got the same vision problem, but they decided that I'm going to focus on far away and not so much far up close. I know there's variations between that because I have a good friend of mine who um, is an engineer, always been a slow reader, and uh, you know, he's got the same binocular problem where his eyes don't pull together very well up close. And the thing, the interesting thing is, he loves playing basketball. He's good at three pointers. He sucks at layups. <laughs> yeah. That makes, that makes so sense. Anything close, anything close, he loses it. Anything far, he's fine. So it's like I can, I, I've got a problem, but I can only function at one. You know, I, if, if I want to try to function with this problem, I can only do things really well at a particular distance. So which, which is, which is it going to be? Far away or up close, or somewhere in between, or do I kind of switch back and forth? Yes, sir. Is that like a problem with depth perception? Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, basically, yeah. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. That's basically what it is. So, this is something I want to share with you guys, you know, just because nobody seems to know about it. And uh, for those of you who may know of somebody who's got a problem like this, you know, if they're a poor reader or they have really poor eye hand coordination or whatnot, or really thick glasses, uh, they, they, they pretty much all got a problem. They do. Uh, I, know, I know they do. The question is, uh, is it worth treating at this point? Because it may not be worth treating, or it may be too difficult to treat. If we catch it early enough, I can do something about it. Uh, and, and the other thing is that if you feel that you have difficulty multitasking, or maybe you're really, maybe, maybe you're really good at multitasking, but darn it, you can't remember details for the word of darn. Okay, so there are different personalities, depending on your personality, because you can only take in so much information at once. You can only process so much information at once. Okay. So, um, you know, as far as any kind of treatment is concerned, you know, I usually have to do an exam to find out exactly what the problem is, you know. And the thing is, just like I was saying, just because you have a binocular problem doesn't mean it won't, that it necessarily leads to something that is going to be difficult to, to be difficult for your life. Because for those, for those people who, who um, you know, like I was saying, if they, if, if they do the, uh, you know, you really up close and one eye drifts out, the other one pulls together, Frankly, they're actually pretty good at that perception. They actually they function pretty well. So basically all they've done is they developed a physical adaptation. They developed a physical adaptation in response to the stress on their system. And if, if the physical adaptation, you know, once they get older, once they get older, their eyes don't change very much. And if their eyes aren't changing anymore, then there's no point trees. So, um, that's basically everything I wanted to share. Yes, thank you. What age do you typically consider? What age would you typically consider being too old? Uh, that's an interesting question. It kind of it depends more on how 
better the problem is and less on age. But age is a factor. Um, if I have a patient who's a slow reader, I've mean, seen patients who are in their late 30s. Uh, I, I, there was a few years back, I had a patient who, um, at the time, I think he was 39 or something like that. And uh, he took something like 15 years to go through college. It took them forever to go through college. And so this is somebody who's got a problem, but they've never figured out a way to strategically get around their problem. Okay, so if that's the case, if they haven't figured out any kind of adaptive strategy, then, then even though they've had it for a while, it's still pretty fixable. The ones who are difficult to fix are the ones who have figured out a way to get around the problem and can't, and, and now try to you know, bring them back, it's become very difficult. Uh, that's good. What about the Bates methods? Oh, uh, Bates, the question was about Bates. Uh, Bates method is specifically more for eye relaxation. It's more specific for uh, nearsightedness. Uh, Bates has some interesting theories. It works for certain types of problems. If you have eye strain, if you have, uh, if you're a progressively nearsighted, uh, that can help. It can help, uh, but it's not very tailored because it's. It doesn't, it doesn't involve testing of any kind. Basically, we're just, it's more like general relaxation techniques. Can you share with us what is bad about the use of our eyes and our computers? We get too much television, not staring away. Okay, uh, okay for, for, for computer use, typically, you know, most of us look at the computer screen, you know, pretty much, if you're, if you're used to working at a cubicle, your computer screen more or less is straight in front of you it would actually be preferable to have it a little bit below eye level. Because your eyes are such that they're more used to looking up close when you're looking down. Because think about it, our ancestors, when we look straight ahead, we're usually looking far away. And if we're looking down, we're more likely to look at something up close. So it's actually easier for your eyes to pull together when you're looking a little bit below eye level. Slightly below eye level instead of here because when it's straight in front of you, when it's directly in your line of sight, that, that's. So the question is do you want to hurt your eyes more or do you want to hurt your neck more? <laughs> that's a good point. Okay. So ideally, <laughs> okay. a little bit below eye level without doing this. But you're right, you know, doing this too much isn't good. And actually, I, I, tell, patients, I tell patients to, you know, what I usually tell the kids is to hold the book. At what we call the Harmon systems. This is this is a this is a um, educational educational physiologist back in the 60s. His name was Harmon uh, Boyd Harmon. And what he found was that the you have the least amount of stress when your book is approximately the distance from your knuckle to your elbow. So you want to hold your book about this distance. So about this distance, below eye level, you want to hold it but not flat. Because if, you're, if it's flat, then you you want to do this. So you actually want to have it tilted up. You want to have it tilted up at about distance from your knuckle to your elbow. That would be ideal. With a very slight, with a slight downward look, not too far down. This isn't good. So yeah, that's that's one thing. And then um, you know, taking breaks every 20 minutes, you know, 15, 20 minutes, looking far away. That's good. Uh, the, one of the biggest problems these days is that kids, little kids, before their eyes are properly developed, before their software is properly developed, they're doing a lot of reading, they're playing a lot with stuff on the clubs. And that, basically that's a, that's a time period where their system is very adaptable. And so basically what you're doing is you're, you're putting stress on the system so that it wants to adapt itself for up close instead of far away. So I'm getting six year olds who are nearsighted already. Minus two, minus three. Wow. I've got two of them this weekend. And it's pretty bad. Wow. Pretty bad. So I got two of them this weekend. They're only six years old. They're not even studying yet. But they're, they, they do a lot of up close work. So, you know, that's one area. Um, you know, basically, you want to provide your eyes with enough time to, uh, to properly develop before applying all that type of stress. And if, you, if it's properly developed, then when you do put stress on your eyes, typically what you end up with is a little eye strain. That's the first thing. You, you start off with eye strain. There's a sequence of events that happens. You first start off with eye strain, 
Then after eye strain, you, 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 how your eyes focus, it starts to get a little bit messed up. Then how your eyes align gets a little bit messed up. And so there's these little stages, the different stages of, de of degeneration that happens. And depending on where along the stage of degeneration, I can determine how long it'll take to bring it back to normal. If you're too far off the deep end, forget it. <laughs> then I just, you know, you're one of those people where you know, you're holding the pencil the wrong way and it's going to let you keep it that way. Okay, sorry. That's it. Thank you, man.